The internet is a series of tubes. <laughs> kidding, kidding. In trying to come up with the perfect introduction for this topic, I spent a lot of time thinking of examples of what life was like before the modern day internet. And after growing incredibly frustrated with that approach, I realized I have no idea what it was like before the internet. Because I, like a lot of you here, was born with the internet. I don't know what it was like to not be able to just instantly get a hold of someone. Because I've always had email and instant message. You know, my friends make fun of me for uh, my Google Calendar invites, but my life relies on my Google Calendar. I don't know what it's like to not keep tabs on distant family and friends because I can just look them up on Facebook. Or I can see what they had for lunch on Instagram. I prefer Cyber Monday over Black Friday. My morning news feeds over the morning newspaper. The internet archive over any brick and mortar library. So I realized after preparing for this talk, I, like most of you, take the internet for granted. Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, a law passed by Congress in 1996 that I bet a lot of you have never heard of. Show of hands, how many of you have heard of the First Amendment? All right, now raise your hand if you've heard of Section 230. You see? we really do take the internet for granted. Because we would fight tooth or nail to protect our First Amendment rights to free speech. But we don't even know about the law that enables our, there is an app for that, lifestyle. A law which these apps we rely on daily owe their very existence. Section 230 was the greatest internet policy achievement Congress passed to date. But because we're not talking about it, it's at risk of being destroyed by people that don't understand the internet or who take it for granted. So what is the internet? Well, it's certainly not a series of tubes. Rather, the internet is a unique and wholly new medium of worldwide communication. But without Section 230, we stand to lose everything we love about it. I'm going to tell you guys a true story about a guy named Ken Zaran. April 19th, 1995, a day that went down in infamy as the Oklahoma City bombing. 170 people killed, 680 plus injured, regarded as the deadliest terrorist assault on US soil until the 9-11 attacks. April 25th, only six days after the attack, a user with the screen name KenZZ03 posted a message to an AOL forum advertising t-shirts with offensive Oklahoma City bombing slogans such as, visit Oklahoma, it's a blast. The message included a phone number and instructed users to please call Ken Zaran for more information. But Ken Zaran wasn't behind the post. He was under attack, e-personation as we call it today. Shortly after that message was posted, Ken received hundreds of abusive phone calls from understandably angry and offended users who saw the advertisement. As a business owner, Ken was in no place to remove his public phone number or change it. So he reached out to AOL and asked them to remove the post, but they were hesitant. The next day, 
Ken ZZ03 posted another message, this time advertising for additional t-shirts, keychains, and bumper stickers with the same offensive slogans. This time the message said, please call back if busy. It got to the point where Ken would receive an abusive phone call every two minutes. To make matters worse, a local radio station picked up the post and urged its users or its listeners to please call Ken. Eventually, a local newspaper posted an article about the anonymous hoax. The radio station issued an on-air apology. AOL finally got around to removing the messages and the phone calls subsided. But to Ken, it was too little, too late. And the damage was already done. So he sued AOL. But he lost to Section 230. These days, social media and the internet have the power to destroy careers and livelihoods. So it seems odd for us to support a law that supports companies like AOL over its users like Ken. Or does it? Section 230, or as internet law professor Jeff Kossif says, puts it, the 26 words that created the internet says, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. Okay, look, I'm a computer scientist and a law student studying internet law. That doesn't make sense. In fact, my advisor and Santa Clara Law internet law professor, Eric Goldman, used to offer to his internet law students an A to anyone who got the 26 words of Section 230 tattooed on a place not normally covered by clothing. <laughs> now I say used to because I bet he's never going to offer that challenge again because I went and did it. <laughs> kind of, so he doesn't really owe me the A yet. I decided not to go through with the 26, the full 26 words because even to a trained lawyer, the 26 words are gibberish and I didn't need the permanent reminder or to give my mom a heart attack. So let's break it down. An interactive computer service would cover web services like AOL, but now modern, it would also cover websites like Facebook, or Twitter. Section 230 also says that these websites are not to be considered the publisher or speaker of such content. Now track with me here because this is interesting. The owner or provider of a newspaper is considered a publisher or a speaker for defamation purposes. So did Congress actually create a law that gives websites more protections than the First Amendment does for the press? They did. And that's what makes Section 230 so powerful. Lastly, these websites are not to be considered the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider or third-party content. Now, of course, we have to figure out the intricate differences between first-party content and third-party content, but that's why we pay lawyers. So for now, just think of third-party content as any user-generated content. So your Facebook posts and your tweets would be covered. To make the 26 words of gibberish a little bit easier, you can think of Section 230 as simply stating, websites are not liable for third-party content. Now, pre-230 internet was depressing. 
I was born in 1995, so I actually have no personal experience with pre-230 internet, but I know some of you in this audience do, and uh, I extend my sympathy. <laughs> pre-230 internet, it costs about 30 bucks an hour to get online. But you couldn't really do anything once you were online unless you paid a $5 an hour subscription to a web service like AOL, just so that you could see an email or watch a cat fall into a box. In fact, back then, people thought that internet would go the same way as the cable companies, where instead of subscribing to certain TV shows, you would actually subscribe to your favorite services like Facebook or Google or Instagram. Section 230 destroyed the subscription model by making the internet a lot more accessible for then startup companies, Facebook and Google, to enter the marketplace and compete, giving us the free apps we love and love to hate today. Pre-230 internet sucked for users. But it wasn't so hot for web services either. Chaos and uncertainty arose for web services as they were being sued for their users' content, typically for defamation when one user would post something negative about another user or business. So these users, sort of like Ken, would go and sue the service. Now, web services that chose to ignore that content to ignore the defamatory uh, posts were actually rewarded. Courts would treat them as mere content distributors instead of publishers. However, web services that decided to try to filter out some of that content, maybe create a family-friendly environment, were punished as publishers of their users' content. We call this the moderator's dilemma, where websites were left with two extremes. On the one hand, websites could do nothing, moderate as little as possible, turn a blind eye, allow their forums to run rampant with outrageously offensive content. Or, on the other, websites could try. Websites could moderate as much as possible, pre-screen every post, create that family-friendly environment, risking liability. To put it in perspective, what if on Facebook you had to scroll through tons of pornography and graphic violence? because they chose to moderate their platform with the first extreme. On the other hand, what if your tweets were delayed by an hour just so a moderator on the other side could pre-screen them before they're posted? I don't know about you, but I like to use Twitter for breaking news updates. So that kind of approach would absolutely destroy that aspect of the service. What if YouTube removed their comments section, even though they probably should? <laughs> or what if Yelp prohibited their users from posting any negative reviews? Archaic, right? If the internet was to become what it is today, what we love about it today, Congress knew that they needed to eliminate the moderator's dilemma. And they did so with Section 230. By allowing websites to freely engage in what we call content moderation, or the process of filtering user-generated content, Congress gave internet companies the much-needed green light to confidently control their platforms while encouraging innovation and free expression online. Now let's circle back. If your sympathy for Ken has you struggling to understand 
why AOL's win was such a monumentally good thing overall, that's okay. I struggled with it too. Because Ken still gets screwed in that story. But the takeaway here isn't about saving Ken. Rather, imagine if social media companies today were just as hesitant as AOL was to remove abusive content. AOL's win set a precedent for Section 230, encouraging platforms to respond to abuse quickly, protecting us from becoming the next Ken Zoran. These days, it's not easy to stand up here fighting for social media companies. Just last week, there was a study published about how Twitter is anti-conservative. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard the same thing about Facebook and Google. But there's a few flaws with that Twitter study I'd like to call your attention to. Number one, if you're going to accuse a platform that has 321 million active users monthly of being anti-conservative, your study may want to include more than 22 banned accounts. And second, of those banned accounts, if they include Sandy Hook denier, Alex Jones, the American Nazi party, white nationalists, professional trolls, and Holocaust deniers, you may want to reevaluate your version of conservatism. Senator Ted Cruz mistakenly claimed social media companies are required to maintain a neutral platform incorrectly comparing them to our offline public forums and town halls, which may explain a lot of the confusion and anger a lot of us have towards social media companies these days. Well, think about it. Imagine if these websites were required to be neutral. What a lot of people don't know about content moderation is that the majority of, it, majority of it is actually done manually by humans. So first, you'd have to eliminate human bias, which is impossible. But more importantly, remember that archaic pre-230 internet and the moderator's dilemma? Well, if websites were going to be completely neutral, they'd have to go with the second approach, ban everything. Content moderation is already difficult enough. Mandating neutrality would make it impossible. But don't take it from me. Let's actually step into the shoes of a content moderator and see what it's like from their perspective. You make the call. Janie's a psycho and we'll get what's coming to her gun emoji, gun emoji. Fold up your PFA and put it in your pocket. Is it thick enough to stop a bullet? Put on your moderator hat for a second. Would you remove this or keep it? It seems like an easy choice because this is obviously a user threatening another user which is forbidden for Twitter's terms. Or what if it's a song lyric? or a TV quote? What if it's an inside joke between these two users? And what's a PFA? Without any context, the decision to remove or keep this is actually incredibly difficult. Let's try another one. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un just stated that the nuclear button is on his desk at all times. Will someone from his depleted and food-starved regime please inform him that I, too, have a nuclear button, but it is a much bigger and more powerful one than his, and my button works. <laughs> Twitter policy expressly prohibits tweets that incite or threaten violence. So do we keep that one or remove it? 
Now, if we keep it, are we hypocrites for letting this user slide <laughs> because he's the president? Or if we remove it, is our platform now anti-conservative? To reiterate, content moderation is hard. It's not like these posts come with a giant neon sign saying, bad content, please remove. But that's OK. Because social media companies are not required to maintain a neutral public forum. Rather, we should think of social media platforms as gardens to which their moderators tend. Now, without any moderation or care, a garden would become overrun with weeds or trolls. But with the proper care and proper moderation, those weeds can be controlled, making way for bountiful crop. Or in our case, fruitful and informed discussion. We want social media companies to tend to their internet gardens as we see fit, or as they see fit. And Section 230 incentivizes such moderation. Now, some actually prefer that the government step in and start regulating these moderation decisions. But after the Zuckerberg hearing, do we really want the government regulating our internet? Unfortunately, we seem to be headed that way. Last year, Congress enacted the first major blow to Section 230, the Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act, otherwise known as FOSTA. As you know, sex trafficking is a dark, dangerous, and brutally unforgiving world for those that fall victim to it. Given the dark web and the ability to shield our offline identities, sex trafficking has become a very real and very complex problem, especially for children. So it does make sense that the government sought a solution. However, FOSTA was not the solution. FOSTA was framed to stop online sex trafficking, when in reality, all it did was bury the problem, making it harder for investigators to find sex traffickers, because they're no longer on the internet, while simultaneously forcing legitimate sex workers back onto the streets to face abuse, harm, and in some recent cases, death. Section 230, sorry, FOSTA did nothing to curb sex trafficking, but everything to curb online free speech. FOSTA imposes severe violations on websites that know or could have known about sex trafficking on their service. So the moderator's dilemma has returned, where websites are terrified of hosting any user content that could be considered sex trafficking. So they opt for the second extreme ban everything. For example, Craigslist banned their personal section. Tumblr, just last year, banned all adult content. Facebook changed their terms to ban adult speech. And websites that once served as a safe online home for sex workers to vet their clients or to have safe discussions either shut down or simply ban their sex worker communities. Thanks to FOSTA, the internet has shrunk. 
FOSTA was a bleak warning for Section 230's fate, and that is why I'm here tonight. Understandably, we're angry at Facebook and Twitter and Google, but when we're angry at hate groups and political controversy and the deplorable past and present speech of our nation's leaders, do we push for changes to the First Amendment? Of course not. Some beg Congress to eliminate the big tech problem, to step in by enacting more internet regulation. But ironically, that call to action actually exacerbates the big tech problem in Silicon Valley, making it a lot harder for smaller companies to enter the marketplace and compete. The truth is, companies like Facebook and Google have the financial means and the technical infrastructure to deal with regulations like FOSTA. Multi-million dollar fines are a mere drop in the bucket for big tech companies. But that's not the case for startup companies. Startup companies don't have the capital to deal with these multi-million dollar fines, and they don't have the lawyers to keep them out of jail. If we want to encourage these bigger tech companies to do better in protecting our data, moderating bots and fake news, and eliminating trolls from their platform, we need these smaller tech companies to come in, put the pressure on them, and provide us with alternative platforms for us to jump ship to. If we want to take back control from these big tech companies, we need to fight for Section 230. We claim we want to hashtag save the internet, but how? Well, start by understanding Section 230, so that when Congress pushes to amend or repeal it, we fight back just as angrily as if we would if they were to amend or repeal the First Amendment, so that when we see celebrities appealing to our emotions, we aren't so easily persuaded. So that when we see a study trending about how social media companies are absurdly biased towards a group, we question it and we think critically. So that when Congress proposes the next fight online sex trafficking bill, we ask what it will do to Section 230. We call our representatives and we demand it's killed. And lastly, when social media companies breach our trust, make poor moderation decisions, and leave us holding the bag, we don't respond with more internet regulation. Rather, with our online presence. We moderate our own content. We encourage informed discussion. We find another platform and we log off. Now, raise your hand if you've heard of Section 230. And keep your hands raised if you could explain it to the person next to you. Great. <laughs> Don't explain it to the person next to you. Go out, explain it to the world, and save the internet. Thank you.